So again, we are going to launch central administration. So start menu, all programs, SharePoint 2010, and central administration. And from central administration, we are going to go to the application management section here. So we're going to manage web applications. There we go. And then we're going to click new. So we are going to create a new web application. And we are going to call that web application company blogs. And we're going to put that web application on port 8085. Now I changed it in the title up here. I also need to change it in the port. Now if we wanted to put this web application on port 80 and we didn't want to have any conflicts with the existing web applications, we'd have to give it a host header as well, like portal.prodataman.com. Now if I did that, then I could use port 80 and there'd be no conflicts. Notice what it does to the virtual directory as well. Virtual directory is called portal.prodataman.com 80. Without the host header, it wants to name the folder 80. So with no host header, the folder that it creates under inetpub www root wss virtual directories, the folder name is the same as the name of the port number. So because we already have a site on port 80 with no host header, there is already a folder called port 80. So we are going to name our site company blogs on port 8085 with no host header. Now our directory should be called 8085. Now we're just going to enable um, NTLM, which is the default. Uh, for this demo, I'm going to allow anonymous access. Now, depending on what it is that you're trying to accomplish, you may not want to allow anonymous access. You might want only authenticated users to be able to view your page. But because this is company blogs, we want pretty much everybody to be able to land on the company blogs page and view all the employee blogs that exist as subwebs beneath that company blog. All right, so we're going to switch that to yes, allow anonymous but we don't have anything too terribly sensitive so we are not going to use secure socket layer or SSL. The public URL, this would be normally in production the address to the load balancer but since we have no load balancer because we're using a virtual machine the URL here is the URL to the actual virtual machine colon the port number that we're running on. But again, in the real world this is a point to the load balancer and the load balancer would figure out which one of the actual machines to send the request to. The next change that we're going to make is at the application pool level. So in the application pool we want the pool to be called the same thing as the application. So we're going to call it company blogs dash 8085. Now in the real world we'd want to make sure that this web application was run under the context of a managed account. Now, since this is not an administration demo, uh, we're going to switch to a non-preferred account, the network service account. Now, in production, I wouldn't want to use the network service account because it is not an LPA. It's not a least privileged account. The network service is the computer account, right? It's the account that runs all code on this machine. So if a virus gets on here, or we have some malicious code on our machine, whatever permissions that we give the network service account, that code will also have, which is why it's preferred to use a least privileged account, um, a managed account, instead of just using network service. But I'm going to use network service because this is just for demonstration purposes. Now the next piece that we want to change is the database name. 
Notice the uh, name of the server, SharePoint, SharePoint, so nice we named it twice. Uh, the SharePoint server is a server called SharePoint with an instance also called SharePoint. But notice the database name. It's SharePoint content, so it's called Windows SharePoint Services underscore content or WSS underscore content. And in order to maintain uniqueness, Windows SharePoint adds a GUID or a globally unique identifier to the end of the database name. Now, I don't know about you, but trying to remember a 128-bit string of characters is not something that I want to do when I'm trying to do a backup or restore from catastrophic failure. I want to make sure that the database name is simple and to the point. WSS, is, uh, WSS underscore content is pretty descriptive. It tells me that it's SharePoint content. But SharePoint content for what? SharePoint content for company blogs. So WSS underscore content underscore company underscore blogs tells me very quickly and easily when looking at the list of databases in SQL Server that this is a SharePoint database, a SharePoint content database that contains data for the company blogs. And then we're going to scroll down to the end here. Now if I had database mirroring configured, I could put the name of the mirror server here under the failover database. And basically what that's doing is adding that uh, mirror server to the connection string as the failover server, the failover partner. What that means in the context of database mirroring is if SQL, or rather SharePoint is unable to connect to the primary database server, it will try to connect to the mirror server. Now since this is a virtual machine environment, we only have a single server, we won't be adding a mirror reference. But in production, if we had database mirroring configured, that's where we would put the name of the mirror server. Now in this web application, if we did not want to allow the creation or access to all of the different services that um, SharePoint provides, we could change this from the default, which is allow everything, to a custom configuration, in which case we only allow the things that we want users to be able to access. Like maybe we only want them to access uh, business data connectivity services. So we would change it to custom and check off just the items that we want. Now we aren't worried about restricting access to resources, so we're going to leave it at the default, which is select everything. And then we are not going to enable the customer experience improvement program because we don't have network access anyway. But that would send some of the information about our configuration and user experience to Microsoft. So we're going to click OK, and we are going to wait for our web application to be created. Now the reason there's a slight delay here while we're waiting for the web application to be created is because we are creating not only the web application and virtual directory under IIS, we are also creating a database under SQL Server. So we're creating a new content database with the name WSS underscore content underscore company underscore blogs. And it's putting all of the standard site template stuff or uh, base web application stuff into that content database. Now this pop-up that's about to appear here is hopefully going to tell us that our web application was created successfully and that we can now go and create a site collection. Now we could click OK, or we could click the link at the bottom of the pop-up that says, once you are finished, to create a new site collection, go to the Create Site Collection page. Now we really want to click on that link. So if you're following along, go ahead and click on that link, but I'm going to click OK, just in case you accidentally clicked OK as soon as the pop-up appeared. Reflexes. So we're going to switch uh, now to company blogs here in the list of web applications. But what we really want to do is create a site collection. So back at application management, we have site collections and create site collection. Now when I click on this link, for those of you that clicked the link in that pop-up that appeared, that would have taken you to a window that looks almost exactly like the window that I'm in now, with one exception. This web application selection is not there. That's because when you clicked on the link, it took you into the Create Site Collection window for that web application. But three months later, if I want to come back and create another site collection in that same web application, I would come here and I would choose, because probably 
the web application that I created three months ago will not be the default web application. So I can choose to change my web application and then from the list here I would just choose the web application that I want to add my site collection to. So my site collection might be a little confusing but I'm also going to call my site collection company blogs. I'm going to leave it at the root of the web application. And I'm going to choose the blog site template. And I'm going to scroll down. Now for the sake of this demo, again because this is not an administration uh, demo, we're going to use the uh, administrator as the primary site collection administrator. Now at this point I can press this button over here little head with the check mark next to it that says check names or I could hold the control key down on the keyboard and press K which is exactly the same as pressing the button only different now the secondary site collection administrator is someone that can administer this site in case the primary site collection administrator is unavailable got hit by a bus or just is on vacation or something so here we're gonna make Krishna s the secondary site collection administrator. Now this is one of those things where if you were doing this on your own setup, your own SharePoint setup, this Krishna S account isn't going to be there. So insert your account here. And then we're going to click OK. And after we click OK, SharePoint Central Administration is going to go and create our new site collection inside of our new web application and add the blog template to it. Now all of that site collection data that we just created does not exist on the SharePoint web server. That site collection data that we just created and that site template only exists inside of the SQL Server database. Now if we click on this link, that site will load up. But while we wait for that site to load up, Let's go take a peek at the file system. I'm going to go to the C drive and go to INET pub and then go to www root and then go to WSS and then virtual directories and there we'll see a list of the three virtual directories that I already have. We have 49116 which is central administration we have 80, which is the first uh, default site that was created uh, on port 80. And then we have the web application that we just created uh, on port 8085. The funny thing is, if we go and look at the 8085 web application, it's got a web.config file, standard ASP.NET stuff, a global ASAX file, again, standard ASP.NET stuff, and a WP resources. WP resource just contains another web.config and then a bin folder which is empty app global resources which has some globalization and localization files app browser browser compatibility files the VTI uh, private folder some config files there and app bin. The app bin folder is where all of the magic happens. It's where we have the list of DLLs uh, that make up the API for SharePoint. So this list of DLLs is what tells the code running in IIS how to reference the content in the SQL Server database. So this list of DLLs is what tells our web server how to get the data and display it as actual web pages even though web pages do not exist they're just data in the database so that's the 8085 folder now let's take a quick peek at the 80 folder web.config global asax web.config in the wp resources empty bin folder uh, asp client folder with a system web folder globalization localization files browser compatibility files, VTI private, 
and app bin. Pretty much exactly the same stuff. And I'm not going to go through all the folders here, but you see in the central administration web application folder, it's the exact same stuff again. The point that I'm trying to make here is there is no SharePoint, right? It's just data in the database. It's like the matrix. You have to realize that there is no spoon. Right? There's only the data that's stored in the database. There is nothing in SharePoint. I'm sorry, there's nothing in the web server. Now here's our blog. Our blog says it has default.aspx, and that's what's being displayed here. But if we go look in Windows Explorer under 8085, there is no default.aspx at the root of this web application. It does not exist in the web server. It exists only in the database server. So if we go and launch Microsoft SQL Server 2008, SQL Server Management Studio and we connect Management Studio to our SharePoint slash SharePoint instance and look under the databases folder we should see our new database WSS underscore content underscore company blogs and that is where default.aspx lives in a table in this database. Oh.